today, May 8th. We are still in lockdown, although I think I'm going to be getting rid of the uh, pandemic quarantine beard here soon. So we'll go back to shaving again probably before in my next stream. Um, I wanted to show my latest course here. Just went live uh, Monday, the C Sharp Design Pattern Singleton course. <clears throat> I have another course uh, that's currently almost ready to publish, which is a design pattern overview. It's going to go in the uh, design patterns skill path. I think you can see if this is in a path somewhere. Um, I'm not sure where the, the learning path for design patterns. Not sure how to find it. Um, do, do, it must be this one. Design patterns in C sharp. And there's the singleton right there. Um, so the uh, the overview one should go in this path somewhere, hopefully toward the start of it. We'll see how that works out for me. And the next one I'm doing is on template method. And so my goal for today is to create the demos for my template method. Um, so let's pull up the chat, see who's here. Got uh, Surly Dev, can always count on you. Tony Davis, Zemcat, welcome. Allergy has been really bugging me uh, this week. And for some reason today in Ohio it's extremely cold. It's supposed to be like 27 degrees this evening, which is crazy. Um, but enough about that. Let's get into here. So the repo I'm working on, I'll pull this up here as well, is at github.com or Dallas Design Patterns in C Sharp, maybe? Hey, I got it right. Um, so if you want to follow along with this code, you want to see it afterward. Oh, that's Fahrenheit. That's Fahrenheit. Uh, let's see, uh, weather. Right now it's 40, uh, but it's supposed to be 29, right? So zero is 32. So it'll be, you know, negative one C in May in Ohio, which it is, is cold. You know, it's definitely colder than usual. <coughs> um... Yeah, there we go, there we go, all right, so uh, if you look around in this right now, what you will see is I've got adapter, prototype, proxy, singleton, prototype's not really, there's nothing there, I think that's just an empty folder. Um, so adapter, proxy, singleton, those are courses I've got published. Uh, hey, Brave Cobra 2, thanks for joining us. This uh, kata with patterns is one I just did for the overview, and it's the Gilded Rose kata, which is one of my favorite refactoring katas, and it has a bunch of different stuff, including an example of template method. But I want to do a dedicated template method demo for that course. And it needs to have both a you know a bad example of why you know it's not great if you don't have it, uh, and then uh, um, you know refactor it or apply the pattern and show why it's it's better perhaps. So that's kind of my my goal for today. So the first thing we're going to do is just create a folder to work in. And, well, first thing we'll just create a branch to work in. Let's make a new branch. Like so. And then we will go back to work. Create a folder. Um, and last night I just did a talk on clean architecture at the uh, a virtual talk for the Orlando.net uh, user group. So they're going to have that on YouTube if you're interested. And then uh, tomorrow I'm actually scheduled to do a talk with uh, this, this online conference for the first time. Um, and that is at 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. At least I hope it's Eastern Time, because that's when I'm gonna go there. But uh, here's the link to there. And I'll throw that up over here too. So this is the tweet that they just put. It's called CouchCon, because you can you know do it from your couch. Uh, and I'll be talking about improving the design of existing software, which is going to talk about refactoring and principles and heuristics and um, things to, to look at to identify problems in your code and then how to make your code better. So uh, and I have to squeeze it into 50 minutes because it's usually uh, about an hour long talk. So I'll, I'll cut a few things out or I'll talk really fast. All right. So if you want, you can join me tomorrow for that. Um, yeah. So let's go back into Visual Studio and we will create our folder finally. 
somewhere. Add new folder. All right, and then we need like a bad example of template method. So add a new class. And the usual thing I've been doing with this example when I'm talking about how to apply it is you need some kind of algorithm, some kind of process that you're following, right? So um, I think if you had a bakery and you had uh, a bakery that produced both pies, because, you know, that's pretty normal, as well as maybe cakes would be an option, but definitely also then pizzas. And I know that's a little weird because most bakeries aren't also pizza shops, but um, the pizza and the pie work really closely together. The cake, uh, I'm not so sure of. Um, but if we had like a uh, pie baking service, I'm probably going to change that like this. And we made this public and we gave it some public pie uh, bake pie like that. And we need a pie class, so I'll say public class pie. Don't know what a pie is yet, but we'll have that there. And what do you need to do to bake a pie? Well, you need to do like turn on. Uh, now, what do you need? To do? You need to prepare the dough for the pie crust. You need to um, put the crust in the pan. can't type in the pan what else um pull chat back up just bread you were already following me yeah but that doesn't mean you see everything hey tony davis how's it going um put the crust in the pan then you add the eye add the pie filling you need to cover the pie for most pies not always uh and then you need to uh bake for X amount of time, and then maybe you, uh, what do you do after that? You want to cut the pie, you know, cut the pie into six slices, let's, let's be very specific here, um, and that's it, right? And you're going to serve this, this pie that's been cut up, right? Um, and so we would do all these steps, and so for each one of these, let's make a method for it, right? So we need a, um, prepare crust method and that should probably take uh didn't take anything no it doesn't need to take anything so we'll just generate a method for that and then we'll say and this is just a demo so it's going to be like a lot of console writes probably you can't eat six slices yeah cut it into four it's less food that way could you create a recipe step item and have a list of recipe steps you could but that's more like the rule pattern that's not so much the template method pattern so it's a different approach to the problem, um, but it's it's not this uh, this pattern. So um, putting the crust in the pan that could probably be part of preparing the crust. So we're gonna just ditch that one. That one's not that interesting. Um, we'll add filling, add filling, generate that method, um, cover pie. Is that like a prepare top crust or what would that be? I guess let's call it cover pie generate method and then we'll have a bake method which is the actual bake method as opposed to bake pie maybe this should just be prepare pie or create pie we'll call it prepare bake needs that and then slice there all right and we probably need pie in the name so cover bake slice well, that works well um, now this all assumes that this pie is going to be something that I operate on as a as a field level thing, so that I'm not passing around any parameters, and that's probably fine because uh, this is all inside of this one service. All right, so then uh, I am going to want to be able to write output with this. So let's because I'm going to write tests for this I, and not just run it as a console app. I probably want to have some kind of text writer that I pass to it. So. Um, I have this already done in Singleton, in one of these things here, this iText Output Helper uh, exposes what? Somewhere 
Singleton test helper. Testing. Somewhere I have a helper method on the logger. There it is. And now that was just creating strings. Logger output to list. I'm looking for how I actually do output in here. I'm trying to remember where I did that. Um, the logger was doing it. Why not see it here? Logger and queue clear. Return a string. Okay. That doesn't actually. So when I call logger.log, it enqueues the message. When I call dump, it creates the string. Do I have a test helper doing it? No. What about redirecting standard out to a memory stream in the unit tests? Uh, you can probably do that. Yeah, I test output helper is, a, is an X-unit thing. I, th I want to say that there's a way. There it is. I'll put that right line. So I test output helper has a right line method. I don't want to couple my implementation code to this, but um, I thought this thing had just a, a stream writer I could use, but I don't see it. Redirecting standard out to memory stream. How do I do that, Tony Davis? If I did make this a console app. The other thing is that uh, this is one project with a whole lot of separate uh, things in it. I don't want to have a single static void main for just template method because then I couldn't have it for any of the other ones. Right? So I really want some some driver for this that, that lets me get the output. Um, so you know what? I think I will just make this a logger and then I can do whatever I want with that logger. Right? Um, so if we just take in an ilogger logger here and what is that ilogger? Microsoft extensions logging? Okay, that's fine. Um, hmm, that's probably not what I want. Um, I want my own logger. I'll just make my own logger adapter and put it right here. And it doesn't even need to be an interface. I'll just make it that. <coughs> uh, public class logger adapter. Public void log string message. And it could just have a list of messages. Private list of string messages. New list of string and messages. Add message. And then I could just dump that out at some point. Public string dump. String builder. Is there a way to take a list of strings into a string builder? No. All right. There's definitely a better way to do this for each. Than I'm about to write, but for each var message in messages sp dot append line. When I'm on each on an own line, um, message. We inject loggers in business code and have a logger implementation to test that logs to... Yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing. I just... I don't want this thing to depend on any of the other code that's in this demo uh, repository, so I want all the code for this to be right here. So that's why I'm writing it myself instead of having some common logger abstraction. So that should work. So if I take in this logger and I inject it... Um, why are you not letting me... Control dot... There we go. There then all I want to do is be able to come down in here and say logger.log cutting into six slices, right? Like that. And then uh, bake, we'll say, how long do you bake a pie? Baking for uh, 45 minutes, let's say. I don't know. Depends on the kind of pie, I guess. Um, and what temperature. Cover pie, uh, adding uh, strips of dough over the Dutch apple pie. Right? Dutch apple pie has strips of dough over it, doesn't it? Adding apple pie filling, and then prepare crust. Cover pie is cover. Cover pie is covered. Oh, did I rename that? 
there we go. Thank you. Um, and prepare crest. We do uh, rolling out crust and pressing into pie pan. Here we go. All right, so there's my steps. Um, let's prepare pie. Doesn't return anything. We need to probably have a pie private pie pie. Um, when we prepare pie, we'll create a new instance of that. And when we're done, we'll return it. That's probably okay. And then, and then it's available to all these other things. Hey, thanks for the follow, Mushimitsi. Uh, message to join environment new line instead of string builder. That's probably good. I was trying to remember how to do that, so thank you. Um, do, 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 dump would just be return messages dot join. Can I do what you're saying here? This is gonna be a link join. I need to, to be an array, don't I? D to array dot join. No, is it string dot join? String dot join. Messages. Do I need the area? I need the separator. So environment dot new line, comma, maybe just messages. It takes an enumerable like that. Is that the same thing? Thank you. I knew there was a cleaner way to do it. Uh, Vaishyard. I'm not sure how to say your name. Sorry. All right. So that's looking good. Now I just need a way to run this, right? Um, so pie baking service prepare pie is the name of my test because this is the class I'm testing. This is the method I'm testing. So I'll just put it right here. And what does it do? It uh, has that. It says uh, public void. You need to have X unit. Um, I don't really want to check all the log messages. I just want to verify it returns a, a pie. So returns a pie. There we go. Var um, service equals new pie baking service. Service dot prepare the pie, and it's going to need a logger. service like that now prepare the pie and assert not null on the result on the pie this is a really dumb test but at least it should let me get my log output now to see that log output um, let's put this into its own class right here and I'm gonna go steal some code from Singleton here, where I've got that, and here it goes here, and then this constructor goes here. Does anybody else think it would be nice if C# -sharp had like a constructor keyword, so when you copy paste constructors, they still stay constructors? Um, I don't need to reset that. Output equals output. Uh, I don't need that. But I can now just say output dot right line logger dot dump. Does that work? Let's find out. Can we build? Hey, look at that. And can we run the test? I think it should work. It's green, that's good. We've got something that's not null, and here's what we did. Roll out the crust, press in the pan, apply the filling, add the strips for apple, Dutch apple pie. All right, now it's bothering me because I'm not sure I'm right about that. There's a type of pie. Dutch apple pie has this, this crumbly crust on it. What's the type of pie that has like the cross hatch that looks like that? What is that called? Um, Apple pie with cross hatch dough. Looks like that. So what's this called? So just 
lattice top pie. Okay. So you can make a lattice pie with cherries or other things. We'll call it lattice top. All right. Perfect. That's what I needed to know. So in our pie baking service, we're going to just say we're adding lattice top. Add lattice top. That works. All right. Uh, and it doesn't have to be apple. We'll just say we're adding our pie filling. Perfect. Okay. Now we're going to copy paste all this code. So the logger adapter comes out. But everything else in here we're going to copy paste and we're going to do pizza. Um, so save everything. Take this pie baking service. Copy paste it here. And see, I aim to serve. I'm teaching English words here. Pizza baking service. All right. And the pizza baking service makes a pizza. And pizza baking service. Pizza baking service, which has a pizza pie. Pizza. Pizza. Um, should have done this as well. There we go. All right, now what do you do with... Uh, Pizza. Well, should have gotten rid of some comments over here. I don't need all these anymore. Delete that and that and that and that and that. And that cause comments are useless, especially when they are the same as your method names. Um, so these can all go also. <coughs> um, right. So the other thing I don't like. Let's see, that should be pizza. I don't like the fact that these are in reverse order from those, which is my own fault, but. I really think they should be in the same order. Um, so let's, I should have done that before I copy pasted the world. Prepare crust, then add filling. And slice goes at the bottom. And cover goes before bake. There we go. We don't add a lattice top to a pizza. In fact, we don't cover it with anything. So it's just going to no op. Matter of fact, we don't even need that. We'll just delete it. Um, so cover goes away, and we we don't add a filling. We add toppings. So we prepare the crust, rolling out, and hand tossing the dough, and then we add toppings here, there, adding pizza toppings, and we bake it for not 45 minutes because that would really be bad and our pizza shop would not be able to respond rapidly to orders and we cut the pizza into let's say eight slices because we're really hungry so we want a lot of slices um, all right so now that should work and let me just do the same thing here I wish there were an easier way to do this but if there is I don't know what it is so slice goes there this goes there. <clears throat> Prepare, then add the filling. And then bake is the penultimate step. Penultimate, that might be another new word for some people. It's like the ultimate writing utensil. The penultimate. It's your dad joke for today. Alright, so that's good. We're going to take this test and copy paste it. And now this is going to be pizza baking service prepare pizza and copy that and that and returns a pizza and this becomes pizza baking service pizza dot prepare pie is it really what I still called it now let's be prepare pizza all right Do that. Do that. Okay. I can write my typos with my new pen ultimate. Perfect. Collapsing two definitions makes moving methods around a little easier. That's true. I could have done that. Thanks for telling me now, Tony. Um, Alright, so now let's run this test. And it passes because it doesn't do a whole lot. 
and we see we're gonna roll out and hand toss the dough, add the toppings, bake for 15 minutes, cut into eight slices. All right, now that is a good stopping point. So let's go commit this and say that we have created initial template method uh, problem sample, let's say, and commit all that. So, all right, so if we were to analyze this code, if you came around and saw this code in your actual business code for your company or whatever, you might see that if we look at this and we look at this, um, that there's a, a fair bit of similarity, not so much duplication, but similarity between these two processes. And you can't just extract out a method to take care of it because they're they're different, right? They're similar, but they're they're not exactly the same. Um, and so the challenge is to try and figure out a way to group these in a way that makes sense uh, and, and form an abstraction that can be applied to this that accounts for the fact that there are differences and, and still lets them vary independently. Um, the other thing you want to be sure of is that when someone's creating a different type of uh, service like this, that perhaps the sequence of these things uh, takes is taken into account, like that you enforce that sequence. Now it's not necessarily as important here because these are fairly unique processes, I suppose, um, or, or I don't know, obvious. But you know, there's nothing that would prevent somebody from creating a new uh, service like this, and maybe they would decide to slice it before they baked it, right? And that would not end well, right? If you slice the pizza before you bake it then all the cheese just melts all together and you don't have slices anymore when you're done. You just have a mess. Um, and in your business processes, when you have that type of temporal coupling where this one always should follow this one, um, a lot of times there's no way to enforce it. Well, the template method pattern provides a way to enforce that sequence uh, so that it always happens in this sequence. So now the next step would be to try and take this commonality and try and pull it into some kind of a base class that would have these things in it. So we'll start with the pizza service. Um, and so for the pizza service, we will create a, an abstract base class, public abstract class, and what should we call this thing? It's a something baking service, or it's a baking service base. Uh, so what is a pizza or a pie? It's a, a round dough-based baking thing, I don't know. What's, uh, what's a generic name for that? We'll just call it baking service. Um, hmm, I don't like that. They both use pans. Let's see, uh, pan, pan food baking service. Uh, pan baking service base. I don't like that name, but maybe I'll fix it later. Um, okay, so there's our abstract class. Now it needs to have this prepare method. Right, so it has a public um, pan making service, let's say, of T, where, or no, maybe it just needs a base, uh, pan based food or something item. So public class uh, baked pan food. And that can be abstract also, right? So we do that. And so this is uh, the thing that, that we're gonna inherit from. And that could be an interface too, if we want. It doesn't have to be an abstract class, but that's what we're gonna return. We're gonna return a baked pan food, and I'll probably change this to be generic. Um, and this will have a prepare method. Okay, so in this prepare method, <clears throat> we need to return uh, that, that baked pan food somehow. Um, I think I need that to be generic. So I make this of t, uh, where t colon baked pan food, then I can make this return t, um, and that's probably better. So I can say t item equals new t, All right? And maybe this needs to be like new. Big fan, come on, new, like that. There we go. And then do other whole bunch of other stuff and then return the item. That might work. It's a pizza base. Are you putting the solution on GitHub? Yeah, it's already on GitHub. Um, 
It's the do 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 this guy. Design patterns in C sharp. Um, I'm in a new branch and I haven't pushed it yet, but I will be. So this is where this is where it'll be. Now it is a pizza base for now, right? But um, I see what you're saying. But this is going to be the base for Pi also. That's why I'm trying to be more abstract. All right, let's leave Pi out of it for a minute so we can have this whole screen for ourselves. Um, okay, so inside of here, we're going to instantiate this thing and return it. Uh, we probably want it to still be a field, actually. So this should be a protected T item there. And then this can be just underscore item and underscore item. And essentially, we're going to do all this stuff. Copy all that up into here. Um, and then I need to create those things somehow. Well, they can either be abstract or virtual uh, methods. And so for now, I'm just going to make them all abstract. So I'm going to take these methods here, and copy them up into here, and then just make this... Um, abstract, delete all those things, I keep wanting to add it there, abstract, like that, and get rid of that, and that, and that, and then semicolon all the things, except that thing, um, alright, so what are you not happy about? They can't be private. Well, of course they can't be private. Um, what should they be? They should be protected, I guess. Okay. Now, pizza can start to inherit from this. So, um, in order for pizza to leverage this stuff here, this is now enforcing the process, um, pizza itself needs to inherit from baked pan food, or implement it if it were an interface. So come in here and make this baked pan food um, and this baking service now needs to inherit from pan baking service base of pizza so that's this of this all right um, and that logger could actually probably be pushed up into the base class but we won't do that yet um, so now if we implement this abstract class it's going to say I need to do all these things and I don't need prepare pizza anymore so this goes away and all these private void things that I have here become protected override void so I'll do that instead of private and that should do the same thing if I did it right um, let's build that now our test is going to blow up and say it doesn't have prepare pizza, but it does have prepare. And if I build that, um, and we run this test one more time, we should get the same output. Roll out the pizza, the toppings, bake, cut. Okay, so that didn't really do a whole lot for us when there's only one of these services. Um, but now that we have this separate abstraction. Move that there. Move that to its own thing. Then we can apply the same rule to how we make pies. So the pie baking service uh, which I've lost. I guess it's over here. Right here? Oh yeah, because I put it in a separate tab. Um, it's pie. Let's keep that in a separate tab. Yeah. here. Uh, it's pie needs to inherit from baked pan food. And then it's uh, going to inherit from the abstract class PBSB of pie. And then notice this one has this cover method. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, we're going to control dot implement. And it gives us all these things. So protected override is going to replace all the privates. All 
All right, and these should work. Except we also changed the names of some of these, right? So it's now add toppings. Uh, so that's instead of add filling, which maybe we need to change that name. And cover doesn't exist. So I'm going to comment that out for now it's just so we can get things building. Um, these can go. I think we're good. Nope, not even close. No, I got rid of those. Oh, okay, it was just slow. Um, Alright, so cover doesn't exist. Yeah, I know. We're getting rid of it for a second. What else? Add filling. Add filling is add toppings. But we're not going to use this method anyway. Right? So that was going to be that. We should be able to build. We should be able to run the test for this thing, which is not here, but I can just right click on this and say run that test. And go to. I don't want to do that. Go to the test here. Show me the output. Still looks the same except for the cover parts missing, but that's expected. All right, now that is actually running prepare pi. It's not running our new prepare method. So we want it to just run the base prepare method, and that should do the same thing. So let's verify it does. Looks right. All right, now that means I don't need this anymore. Um, so that goes away. Now I need some way to call this cover thing. Um, and so when this type of thing happens, you typically want to add functionality to your base to allow adding additional functionality somewhere. Um, and there's a couple ways you could do it, right? You could call it from add toppings, right? I could go in here and I could say cover. Um, if I un undo it here. And now it would just be a private uh, void at that point. And if we build this, then run our test, it should pretty much work. Right? So we go in here and we look at this, and now we're adding that lattice top at the right point in time um, before we bake. But we can't always do that. There could be other stuff happening in the process that. Um, makes it so just tacking it on to some other thing doesn't work. And so for that, we really want there to be a hook for optionally doing other stuff. Um, and so we want to go back to the base type, this, this service here. Uh, go to there. And we'll add that cover option here. Stop helping me, Visual Studio. Thank you. Um, but this time we're going to make it an optional thing. So instead of being abstract where you have to implement it, we're going to have a protected virtual void cover that doesn't do anything um, by default, right? So but what it does do is it gives us a hook that we can use in our pie baking service. So we come over into the pie baking service and put this thing back in here as just a protected override void cover. Get rid of that call there. We don't want to do it twice. Uh, and build this. And now we have an option to hook that in. So when we go back to the pie baking service tests, which I closed. Run them one more time. We should see that we are adding to the top. Does that sound good? All right, so um, one of the things I need to cover in the course is going to be when do you create a virtual override and when do you create an abstract method on your base class. So the pan baking service base you see has this is the template method, which I should probably label that. It's the method that provides a template for how to perform an algorithm or like a recipe or a process. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. These are the steps. These are the steps that have to be performed. They have to be performed in this order and you always have to perform these steps. Um, now, if you're a concrete implementation of this process, then 
you get to decide exactly what you do in each one of these steps, but you don't get to change this. All right, if we were doing this in Java, this would be a sealed method so that you wouldn't be able to inherit from it. And since we're in C Sharp, we get that as the default behavior. Right? This is not virtual. You're not supposed to be able to override it. Um, it's pretty much locked in. But you can do whatever you want in here. Now the other place where you see template method done a lot in the real world is in frameworks that use events. Um, for example, uh, for years and years I wrote ASP.NET code using web forms. In web forms you would typically have methods you would override for things like uh, page load and page pre-render and page you know render and stuff like that. Each one of those got called at a, at a preordained time in the lifecycle of that page. That sequence of when those things got called was basically a template method that I was hooking into. Um, and, and so whether or not I decided to do anything at, at page load or page init or whatever it might be um, was up to me, but I couldn't change the sequence. I couldn't decide that page init happened after page load or, or do anything with that, right? That was, that was built into the page type that I didn't have access to. And so that's what, what this is doing, the same thing. Um, now, sometimes you want to add conditional logic in here, potentially. And so it might be that, you know, maybe cover only should be called under certain circumstances. Um, and so there might be other complexity that, that gets added here. Uh, maybe some of these methods aren't just void. Maybe they return something. And based on what they return, it might impact whether or not this thing gets called. Um, and perhaps if we if we spruce up this demo a little bit so that we really are returning something of interest um, that can tell us about itself, I think maybe that would be more interesting than just uh, some console write statements. So um, maybe there's different types of pizzas or pies that you would specify what you what you want. Let me think about that. I mean, as it stands, this is a reasonable demo and it kind of demonstrates the pattern. I'm just wondering if it adds value to, to go any further than this to have an actual pizza or pie that has certain properties that, you know, we can add to it as we build it. Um, in any case, I think everything is passing now. I don't think I broke anything. Um, so this is another good place to check in and maybe push the existing changes up. Okay, that looks good. So let's go back to our changes. That's what that was. No. Back. Um, apply template method to pizza and pie services. Commit sync. No, really, I said sync. All right, so now it should be out there on GitHub um, if any of you want to play with it or see it. So out here under branches, there's a template method branch that has all this code in it, right here. I see a bunch of people have joined. Um, it's great to have you here this Friday. If you have any questions about design patterns or uh, template method in particular, other patterns if you like, uh, feel free to let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll answer them as best I can. trying to decide if there's anything else to do here. I think we might be done. Um, let me look at my old demo. So this was my, my old demo I did uh, for template method back in 2010 or 2011 when I first did this. What if we don't need to bake it in some cases? What kind of a baked pie item would you not need to bake? So this was what I had <clears throat> um, for the demo from the old one. And I'll, I'll come back to Boker Tuman in a second. Uh, but I wanted to finish showing this. So here is how you would uh, send a shipment, either using UPS or using FedEx. Um, and so when you go to ship it, you would verify the shipping data, you'd get the label, and you'd print it. Um, this, was the, this is the abstract one. This is the when it's done step. Uh, and then if you were doing a UPS one, you would just override how you got the label. Right? Or a FedEx, you just get override that one method. Um, and that would be sufficient. 
it's a decent demo. I think the one I'm working on now is actually better. Uh, and the reason why this is a web forms page is because I was also showing off here how this stuff works, you know, in terms of being similar to web forms. I don't think web forms is worth uh, looking at at this point um, in 2020. So I'm not going to include this in my demo for the, the revised version of template method. But for those of you that are uh, experienced enough to have had the joy of working with web forms, um, this might, uh, I don't know, this, this might be something that you recall. So we're going to close that. Uh, let's take a look back at my code. This pie baking service. What if we don't need to bake it? Um, Sean says that the strategy pattern finally helped him understand the purpose of interfaces. Me too. That that was it for me as well. Um, I understood. I didn't understand. I, I had the rote knowledge that programming to interfaces was supposedly better than programming to implementations. But I didn't know why. I didn't know what the value was. I didn't know how to make that work. And, and the strategy pattern and dependency injection is when that clicked for me, too. I was like, oh, now it's plug and play. Now I could swap out whatever I want, put something else in there. Um, and, and so that's when you when you actually see that value is when it like all comes together. Like, OK, got it. Um, and for me, I can still remember when I when I figured that out. And I had I had some help. Someone that uh, was a good mentor of mine showed it to me. Um, and it totally changed how I've written software from that day forward. And that was about mm, 15 years ago, um, I would say. Which is the strategy pattern? Which which, uh, which is the strategy pattern? Come on, Surly Dev. The strategy pattern is basically how dependency injection works. So um, I'm actually using it already here. So if we go look at this, where I'm passing in this logger adapter, that's the strategy pattern. Right, I'm, I'm doing this logger.log in a way that I can adjust that logger adapter to be something else if I want. Um, let's say that if I go to definition on, on this, let's say this logger adapter was, was actually just writing to a file, right? And instead of log going to messages, this was like, you know, file dot write line or there's a way to append text. Yeah, file to append text. Uh, log.text comma message. Is there a way to do it? I have to open the file first. Create stream writer. Okay, so like using file equal or using stream equal file to the pen text log.text stream dot no? I don't know. Using var stream stream dot right line message All right let's do it. let's say I was doing that All right and assuming that actually works um, this would be bad for all, all kinds of reasons that I'm not tightly coupled to this file existing um, and so then inside of here no inside of here I've got this logger adapter that I'm like coupled to, right? Maybe I wasn't injecting it in. Maybe I was just using it like this. And it's like var logger equals new logger adapter because that's how you do stuff. And then you were, you know, calling logger.log, right? Well, now I want to unit test this line of code. How do I do that? Because now I, this thing is going to have to have a file. And maybe that path isn't something as nice as what I put here. Maybe that path is actually like, you know, this is going to the the F drive, you know, F colon backslash, whatever. I don't have an F drive, right? I'm screwed. So when I get into, you know, this, this code over here and I'm trying to, to test this code, as soon as it hits this log message and it tries to write to the F drive, it's going to blow up with a file not found exception. Um, and I, I have no way to get this code to run on this computer, right? Because I don't have an F drive. So the way you get rid of that is you don't new this up. Right, um, I have a blog post that talks about new is glue. So anytime you see new in your code, you're gluing yourself to that implementation, and there's no way for you to swap it out. Right, so you, that's bad. So don't do that. Um, so when you use the strategy pattern, you tend to have a lot fewer instances of new in your code. So you know here instead of newing this up directly here, we were just going to use our local field here uh, that's going to have it instead. Now when I follow that approach, you'll notice. There's nowhere in this code that I'm calling new. Um, I don't need that private pie anymore either. 
All right, but if I do a, a quick search here, I don't know why I have that. Go ahead and go. Control F new. All right, it's not there. I'm not newing up anything in this whole service. The thing I'm using, the only thing I'm using really, is this underscore logger, and that's coming in from here. And that's dependency injection, which is the strategy pattern. You remember which word, road you were on when you when I was talking about new as glue? Nice. Yeah, I used to. I think I still do, but there's certain songs that you hear the song and you're like, oh, that reminds me of when I first heard this song. I was right here. It's just weird how your brain cross indexes things, especially audio sometimes. Thanks for the follow, uh, Bortolato and G Man. I appreciate it. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Being able to switch your logger from one logger implementation to another, that's one of the benefits you get from the strategy pattern. But but the strategy pattern is is one of the most useful design patterns there is because of the fact that it lets you decouple your code. It lets you follow a single responsibility principle, right? You don't have to have all the implementation details of how you're gonna log in this service. You can have it be somewhere else and you don't have to inherit it from somewhere else, right? A lot of folks when they're new to object-oriented development, they think inheritance is the way to code reuse. And so if I need this common logger functionality, I'll put it into the base class and you end up with this big long uh, inheritance hierarchies. But you really want to use composition instead of inheritance. And composition means I'll have a reference to the class. Well, where do I get that reference? Well, I'll just new it up. No, you don't want to just new it up. You want to ask for it right here. You ask for it through your constructor and then something provides it to you. And whoever it is that's providing it to you can decide what implementation they want to use. They can give you the real one that you would use in production. They could give you a fake one that they could use during tests. Or you could swap out what implementation you use in production. Yeah, Sean's got it, exactly. Composition over inheritance. A lot of people have heard that, but they don't really get it, right? Just like we didn't necessarily get why interfaces were a big thing um, until you kind of see the benefit of it in, in real examples. Um, all right, so I've probably broken my code at this point. Let me see what all I've changed here. I think I think I undid all the logger adapter. No, I still have that file crap in here. That needs to go. So let's, uh, let's put that back. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Um, build that again. Unfortunately, somebody else did the strategy design pattern on Pluralsight, so I don't have a, a demo in my library here for it currently. I suppose I could always add one just to have it, um, but I don't have a course that goes with it, so can't have them all. Um, all right, so that's that's back to being good. Yeah, now new is a code smell, exactly. Only use it in the correct place. Um, Okay, so you wanted to ask the question, now let me come back to that, that was a good question. What if we don't always want to bake it? What if sometimes we don't want to do one of these steps? Um, well, there's a few options there. So somebody came up with an example of a pie-like thing that you don't need to bake. I suppose you could make a, uh, like a, a veggie pizza that you don't bake. Like, uh, some people have like cream cheese and peppers and, and things on it, like a veggie pizza. Um, Let's, let's just try and do that. So like cold, cold veggie pizza baking service, right? So public class cold veggie pizza baking service, colon PBSB of, still gonna make a pizza. It'll still be a pizza like that. And control dot that into so type. And here, now we're going to control dot that, implement the abstract class, add toppings, um, let me steal the code from pizza, I just need the logger, no I need this to take that, that, do, 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 do. that, um, across, logger, there we go, we've got our logger. Now, I could put this logger into the base class if I wanted to, and that might be worth doing. Since I keep having to repeat that code. I don't want a warning, I just want you to make that a field. There we go. Thank you. Alright. Uh, prepare crust doesn't need to be there twice. And the order on this is not right at all. But let's do this. Alright. Um, if your crust is already made, you don't need to bake a banana cream pie. Okay, that's true. Good idea. Um, 
Right, yeah, baking a banana cream pie would be weird, wouldn't it? There are no baked pies. I don't know about no baked pizza. There are a couple of no baked pie recipes just put in the fridge for a couple hours. Yeah, that's true. There's like a peanut butter pie that I've had that's really good. Um, can't think of a pizza or pie that you don't bake, but now you found some. S'mores pie. Yeah, that would be good. All right, this is a healthier version. Right? This is the, the veggie one. Um, but we can make a, uh, a pie one too. So this is a pizza. So when we add toppings, we are going to uh, add cream, cheese, peppers, and veggies, like cauliflower maybe. We're going to bake. No, we're not. We're not going to bake. We're just going to no-op that. Prepare the crust. That's pretty much roll out dough and press into pan and then slice. Uh, this is like, usually it's in like a baking pan because uh, otherwise it just kind of falls all over the place. So you can, um, you know, slice into squares, right? Um, so there's our cold veggie thing, and, and we aren't calling bake. I mean, we're implementing bake, but we aren't doing anything there. Um, and so that's that's fine. So we're, we're talking about uh, baking in the context of the template method design pattern, for those of you that are just joining us. Um, so we're coming up with different implementations of this step-by-step -step service for preparing some kind of a baked item. In this case, an item that we don't actually bake. Um, Pan baking service base, yeah. So should I make a, a test for that? I suppose I should. Pizza baking service. Um, let's just add it to this one. Special case. Um, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't do that. That's lazy. I'm gonna copy this. Just still somewhat lazy. But start from there. Pizza baking service. This is now a cold veggie pizza baking service. Take that, and that, and it's no longer prepare pizza, it's now just prepare, prepare, and this is now a cold veggie pizza baking service, and that's all I need to change, right? Um, control dot this into its own file, cold veggie, and run the test. And what we're looking for is that it's not being baked, because it's a cold thing. Um, so you roll out the dough, you add the stuff, you slice into squares. Done. Okay, so yeah, that still works. Um, so that just shows another version of it. Now, y'all with your s'mores pies and your, uh, what was the other one? The cream pie. Like, uh, you're making me think I should have a cold pie uh, version of this too. But the point is that you didn't need, in our base class, even though we're calling a method bake, since we're totally implementing that, we can just no-op that. Um, there could be an option though in here to like maybe we don't want that maybe there's overhead involved in, in even making that call we could add if logic to this right and it could be that uh um requiring baking could be a property of of the the item so like this baked pan food maybe this thing exposes a public bull um requires baking get set uh equals true Right, and then inside of our base class, this should be if item dot requires baking, then bake it. Right, and now now you can control that from that base element. All right, so then last time Matt, you have an excellent question. That's something I'm going to cover in the course. Um, and so we'll get to that in a second. Let me just make sure I've got everything else. We have directions for s'mores pie. I'm not going to read that because that'll just make me hungry. Um, we're automating baking decorator pattern. We're not using the decorator pattern here, just a viewer. Um, although I do talk about that elsewhere. But for this, we're just looking at the template method pattern. Instead of a no-op method that's not needed, wouldn't that fall under the need for interface segregation principle? Well, I don't really have an interface here. Well, I suppose I sort of do from the perception of this abstract class, right? So this right here is part of the interface of that abstract class, and I'm forced to depend on it, even though I may not need it. Um, so sure. As soon as bake becomes optional, right, as soon as we say that's going to be an optional element, then it's similar to cover, 
right? And if it's similar to cover, then we'd probably want to switch it from being an abstract and being a virtual void do nothing. Um, <clears throat> it could also be that it's it's something that's very simple by default, like 99% of the implementations of this are going to do the same thing, uh, in which case you could put actual implementation here um, and then allow it to be overridden. So so maybe by default, the when you call this virtual bake method, it just says bake the item. Um, but then you have to decide, you know, if you need to do something special with it, you need to make it longer or a, or a different way, then you could always override that method. All right, so last thing, Matt, getting to your question. What's the difference between making cover virtual or just not do anything with it? Could we have made cover the same way with baking just now? Yes. Um, it's The difference is whether or not you're forcing the uh, the client, the implement, the implementer of this pattern to do something with it, which is what I was just talking about with bake. So... If, if bake is either always the same, so, you know, if, if, if we put in here uh, the logic for it, and let's go ahead and do what I was talking about earlier and pull in the um, logger into this. So we'll come up here and we'll say this thing takes that logger uh, because I want it to have this. Dink, dink. All right, now we've got a logger, and this can go up here, and this could actually just be protected. We'll fix all that up later. No, I'm gonna have to fix it now or else it's not gonna work. Um, but we'll do that in a second. So in here, we just say logger.log, bake the, whatever it's called, bake the item for, you know, that's all we need to know. Um, now, whether or not we implement bake elsewhere is, is an option, right? Um, and I can override it and do nothing with it if I want to. So let's build this and we'll fix all the problems I just created. So these things don't need this, uh, this logger thing. Um, don't need that. And I don't need that. I do need to implement the constructor though, just to pass that to that all right so that's what I need now in each one of these so over here get rid of that get rid of that and just implement that and then yeah yeah oh it does in a second hang on right you're going away are you? Yeah, high baking service, right. That all goes away. And generate that. So there's my three instances of that. Thanks for the follow, Misak Fisak. Uh, you can't touch this 36. Hey, what's up? Um, hey, everything builds. Okay, so now we were looking at this cold veggie thing, right? And there's our implementation. And we had this overriding an abstract method bake. Now we're overriding a, uh, an implementation of bake just to clear it out, right? If we call base.bake, we're gonna get behavior we don't want, which is that it actually uh, bakes the thing. So when we look at this, and we could actually make these tests be a little better and actually have them verify that the right steps are happening. Um, but if we look at this, it says bake the item here. We don't want it to bake, so Instead, we're coming into the service, and we're not calling that, and we're just saying override default behavior here. Um, but we don't even need that if we go into this cold veggies pizza thing, and we make our own cold veggie thing. So where's pizza defined? Go to definition. This is still not in its own class. Let's put that in its own class. Um, and we'll create a public class cold veggie pizza, which will also inherit from baked pan food. Um, but it should have a default of uh, being not require baking, right? So let's give it a constructor. And by default, it'll have base dot requires baking equal false. Okay, so now, if 
fix. No, I don't want to fix formatting. I moved here and file. There we go. Now, if we go back to this one, um, we shouldn't need this anymore, right? We should be able to get rid of this because there's a couple different ways we could do this, and this is just a different way. Um, and if we run this test one more time, it should still not bake it. Oh, it says bake the item. Did I get rid of that if statement? So where's our where's our template method? If requires baking, bake. Okay. Oh, but I didn't make it uh, the right thing. I didn't, I didn't use my new type. Let me get up here. This is a cold veggie pizza. Now, now we're talking. Um, and now the cold veggie pizza. That's that's all good. Let's run this test. When it gets created, it doesn't require baking. And there we go. No baking. All right. Does that make sense? Now I'm just not sure what I should check in. So I don't want to leave this in here. Let's add some notes here. There are a few ways to deal with optional behavior like this. One, override the default and do nothing. Two, uh, add conditional logic to the base template method. And that's pretty much it. Um, three would be implement do nothing uh, hook method in base template only override if you need to do something. Which is what I'm doing for cover. Let's see, cover. There we go. So I see what you're teaching. Wouldn't the cold veggie pizza not inherit from baked pan food? Well, yes, probably so. Uh, in fact, this baked pan food was probably a bad name, um, right? Like you wouldn't put requires baking on something that literally says it's baked right there. But what if we just rename that to pan food, right? Now it's any kind of food that's going to end up in a pan, let's say. Um, we'll do that, right? Of course, it's not smart enough to rename the file like ReSharper would be. Come on, Visual Studio, get with the times. But there we go. Now it's a pan food, and Sean is happy. Right, Sean? What else did I call baked? Anything? Pan baking service base. Uh, pan food service base. That sounds better. How about that? Yep, happy camper. See? Naming is important. I agree with you totally. Now, to get you to present to my user group in Tulsa. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of presentations. I can do it remotely. It's fine. Booking for July. You know, I'll probably still be not traveling in July, which means I'll still be around and available. And now I know which Sean W. you are, because that's not always obvious from the username. All right, um, I think we're good. Let's run all the tests again. Now let's think about, I do think I want to actually change this to have a little bit more behavior. Um, consider my arm twisted. Yeah, just send me a date. Say like, hey, can you speak on this night? And, uh, and then I'll look at my calendar and I'll say, yep, I can do that. And then it shall be done. Thanks for the follow, draw1865. Um, all right, so all our tests pass. Let's do another commit, and then let's... I want these tests to not quite suck as bad as they do right now, like these uh, assert.notNull things where I have to actually look at the output to verify what they did. That's a horrible unit test. Um, so we're going to figure out a way to make this so we can actually test what's happening here, and that'll be the next thing we do. Last event, will, be there, will there be a VOD of this stream? Yeah, it'll be on Twitch for a little while, um, and then it'll, I can push it over to YouTube, usually... Uh, Tuesday night when I'm getting ready to add a link to it in my new newsletter because I procrastinate. Um, all right, so where is changes? Changes. Um, added a pizza that doesn't require baking. Uh, rename some stuff. Commit. Oh, be safe getting your groceries, Lesson Matt. Good luck. Um, 
Steve, regarding the dev beta group, what is the time of meetings? Is it a fixed time once a week? Also, how big are the groups, and are you grouping them based on skill level? It's really not that big. Um, the whole the whole dev beta cohort right now is fewer than ten people. Um, so, you know, there's no there's no grouping. It's just everybody together. Currently, we meet uh, Friday mornings. So we met today. Um, what time is it? One o'clock. So like four hours ago, from nine to ten. Uh, usually we go over a little bit. Like today we went until like 10, 20 or so, but typically it's like about an hour, hour and 15 a week. The times are uh, up to the members. So if that's not a good time for you, the recordings are always available so you can ask questions and then we'll discuss your questions and then you can watch the recording. Obviously that's not as good as being there. So, you know, if you want to have the meeting at a different time, you know, we just, we move them around. Um, for a while now it's been 9 a.m. on Fridays because that's been convenient for, for most people, but um, it doesn't have to be required. Get remote dash V. Okay, Sir Ladev. Are you in the right window? Um, Boker Tuman, all right. Let's see. Sync this thing, push this up, and then we're going to write some better tests. So how do you test template method um, and verify that it's doing what it should do. I think that's that's a good thing to probably show in the course even. Now it's going to depend a whole lot about what you're actually doing. Um, but let's think about what would we put on... Guess who was thinking his Raspberry Pi was lagging, looking at the wrong screen. Yeah. Multitasking for the win. Um, let's go think about... We'll go back to the first one, which was pizza baking service prepare pizza I'm gonna get back a pizza when I'm done how do I know if that pizza was prepared correctly um, well let's put some properties on pizza so maybe it has a list of toppings so let's uh, go in here and give it some properties that we can verify so what would pizza have um, uh, let's see, let's say public int num slices get set. And by default, if you don't slice a pizza, it's one slice, I think. Um, public list of string toppings get, we don't need a set, private set equals new list of string. Um, and then public bull was baked, I think. It's going to start out false, which is fine. And what else do we do? That's about it, right? So um, now we can go into the pizza baking service and prepare the crust. I don't know how to verify that was done in the property of the pizza. It's really, there's not going to be much pizza there if you don't prepare the crust. Although it could have different types of crust. So we could have an enum or something with crust type, maybe. Or just a string. Let's do a string. Public string crust type equals get set defaults to thin. No, defaults to null. Defaults to no crust. It would just be a mess. So you just dump all the pizza on the pan. Should toppings be a read-only list? No, because I'm going to modify it from externally. Like, this is not meant to be a good self-encapsulated entity. Um, I want to be able to modify this from the pizza baking service, so I have to have some way to do it. Now, I could just I could add methods to this to add them, but that's just maybe getting a little bit more object-oriented and encapsulation-y than I need to for this demo. So for now, I'm just going to leave them as properties I can mess with. But if I come into pizza baking service, we say prepare crust. We're going to roll out the dough and we'll say, uh, where's my pizza? There's that, but I'm not using that anymore. I have an underscore item dot. And see, item is not a pizza, is it? No, it is, because uh, it's generics. So item got trust, crust type equals thin, let's say. Um, and before we go even further with this, let's go into my test. And we'll say returns a pizza. That's all good. Um, returns, let's see. It should uh, set crust type to thin. Um, so assert dot equal thin. Let's 
unexpected pizza dot crust type and run that test see if I was able to write thin the same way twice I was uh, alright so now this also gives me an opportunity to clean up this test a little bit because this logger adapter and this service those could both be pulled up so say private read-only logger adapter logger equal new logger adapter like that private read-only PDS no wrong pizza baking service uh, service and then we'll set it in here service equal new pizza baking service with the logger like that all right now these don't need to be there uh, and these are just underscore and then there's a way for me to do that output that right line after each one. I guess I can do it in the finalizer. Uh, how do I do a finalizer? There's a way after. How do you do stuff after in XUnit? I don't usually have to do that. But I'd like to just throw that after every test. Anybody know that off the top of your head? Uh, X unit run method after every test. It's going to be the finalizer, but I never do finalizers. Do, do, do. As far as I know, test space, dispose. Ah, dispose is where you could do it. That would work. Um, that seems to be what people say. Alright. Use X units collection fixture, which I don't really need to use. Dispose is alright. So if I just make the test disposable, then implement the interface, then I can take that and I can take that and throw it in there. And now my test will do that without me having to do it in each test. Um, and really, if all I'm going to do is this pizza to prepare, I could probably pull that out as well, but for now we'll leave it, because I don't want my test to be too difficult to follow what it's doing. But let's do all that and run those tests. Maybe that. Run those tests. Too passed. Alright, so that was good. Um, now let's do toppings, right? If we go look at the pizza baking service, we're going to add toppings, we're going to bake. So when we do baking, we're going to say item.wasbaked equals true. And we add toppings, we're going to say item.toppings.add pepperoni. Item.toppings.add sausage. So that's good enough for now. Um, and then we'll say item dot num slices equals eight. All right, and then we can come back into here, and we can test each of those things. So uh, has let's see, turns a pizza sets crust type to thin sets toppings. To pep sausage assert that contains and this is a collection so the collection is pizza dot toppings and the predicate is pepperoni is that my predicate? I think that's it um, and sausage. All right, let's see if that works. That worked. All right, and then there's a special way to do assertions on the length of a collection. Assert dot equal to uh, pizza dot toppings dot length dot count. 
think. I think there's a thing that always yells at me to change it to. Well, it looks like that works. Alright, so that tells me there's exactly two things and these are what they are. Um, uh, sets baked to true. Assert dot true. Pizza dot was baked. And then let's set slices to eight. Sets num slices to eight. Assert dot equal eight pizza dot num slices. Alright, I can run all these tests and verify this thing's actually doing what it's supposed to do. And those all work. Okay, that's better. I like those tests better. Um, let's commit this. And adding better tests for pizza baking service. Commit all the things. And sync. And it's also testing for spelling elsewhere in your code. Yeah, kinda at this point. Um, I could use enums or constants, and I, and I probably would in real code. Um, but we just haven't gotten there yet. Because, yeah, magic strings are evil. So these are, these are not good. Alright, so now if we look at that pizza baking service, you can see it's actually manipulating the item as it goes, and that makes more sense. That's a better example, I think, than just printing stuff out. Um, so I like that. I think we're I think we're good here, really. I mean, if we look at the base type, we have examples of conditional behavior. We have examples of abstract things that you have to implement. We have examples of virtual things that you can implement that just don't do anything. So they're just sort of hooks that you could hook into. Um, Sometimes in a framework, you would have hooks for things like you see in uh, ASP.NET web forms for like before doing this and after doing this. And those could even be event handlers um, in many cases. But like here, we could have like before add toppings and then after add toppings. Sometimes those are things that you end up adding later. Like, you know, in the first version of ASP.NET web forms, there wasn't a whole lot of that stuff, but by the third or fourth version, there were all kinds of extra things in here. So when you looked at the life cycle, it was like before pre-init, after pre-init, before, before pre-init, right? And so it was just getting a little bit silly. See you, Sean. Thanks for showing up today. I appreciate it. Um, so I don't want to clutter this up with too much more of that, but I do think that that's, it's interesting to, to mention. Um, I think I covered everything in this demo that I want to cover. So anybody have any questions about other patterns or things? I think I might just shift into uh, looking at something else. Interrupt my flow, Tony, please. I'm at a good stopping point. When you build a web API backed by a DDD service, do you approach it API first by writing the open API spec or domain model first? It seems like this is somewhat debated in the industry. Did someone say DDD? Hey, that's my bot. It actually worked. Um, I don't, I don't have a, a religious uh, uh, tie to either one of those. So, you know, either, either one can work. It really depends on if you have the client built yet or not. Um, if I'm just building the back end, maybe I'm building something sort of where I expect that someday some client is going to want to use this, but I don't have a client yet. There's nothing calling this API yet. Then I'm going to start with the domain model because that's what I have. And then I'll expose the things I think someone might find useful. Now, that's usually the worst way to do it, uh, in, in my experience. Um, but if, unless you're going to spend the time to actually build a client for it, uh, it's the only thing you've got in that scenario. Now, a, a much more common scenario in a lot of business applications is someone is building the client. Right? There's a team, it might be your team, it might be another team, and they are building the Angular app or the iOS app, or whatever it is, the Blazor app, and it's going to call these API endpoints. You can just let them tell you 
what those endpoints need to return and what they need to look like, right? So like have the client say, I need, you know, when I pass you this ID, I need back this JSON in this format. And now you know what the spec is, right? That's your OData or your open API rather um, spec and you build from there. Those are both uh, valid approaches and really the client driven one is much better at avoiding Yagni and, and a whole lot of other potential problems. Um, and there's a pattern that's related to that, since we're on patterns today, um, called the BFF pattern, not best friends forever, um, but the BFF cloud pattern is backends for front ends. And the backends for front ends pattern basically says each one of your front ends creates its own backend service tailored to its needs. Now that doesn't mean that that's the the canonical endpoint. That's not like the the true the the full microservice or the full API that you expose, but it's a facade, right? It's a it's a smaller version of it. It's it's an anti-corruption layer in DDD speak, um, so that this Angular app can talk to just this backend service and it only has the things that that Angular app cares about. It doesn't have everything else in your API, and somewhere behind the backend service is where the quote-unquote real API is that it talks to. Uh, and maybe it just shuttles the information there. Um, but, but you know, maybe it has to do some manipulating or some mapping or, or something. But it acts as this facade slash adapter that sits between the client and, and the, the true backend API. Real babes say... I don't know how to pronounce that. Hello, how's it going? So Tony, did that help? We're trying to remain client channel agnostic. These are APIs that can be externally consumed. Can't anticipate their needs. Okay, then if you're not going to create a separate backend service for each one of your clients, then probably your best bet is to create uh, APIs that make sense within your domain, right? And so I would start with the domain model and then I would expose APIs that, that kind of provide uh, endpoints that allow people to manipulate the domain in the way that you expect your domain model is going to be manipulated. Do if statements work similar to Delphi's in C Sharp? Yeah, definitely. Um, they're, they're pretty straightforward. You know, they work the same as in C or C++ or JavaScript. It's if some condition is true, then do whatever is inside the if block. That's, that's it. Let me make sure I'm all checked in. I think I did. Changes. What did I change? <coughs> I deleted some stuff. All right. Um, clean up. Somebody was asking if this would be available online. If you go to youtube.com slash our Dallas, uh, this is where I post all these. So here's last week's stream and on back. You can see that they're getting millions of views and I'm just making loads of money off of all the uh, people watching these. So I really appreciate it. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. There's actually like only 100 views. Um, but they're still there for anyone that wants to see them. So check that out there. Um, back into front ends pattern. Right, how much time have I got? I got about half an hour left. I'm going to go work on one of my open source projects now and we'll, we'll shift gears away from the uh, design pattern stuff. So if we go to github.com or Dallas, um, I think guard clauses might have some. No, let's try smart enum. YouTube algorithm sucks sometimes. Yes, that's true. Um, I don't think that's the reason why I'm not getting lots of views. People really don't want to watch a two-hour stream that's not live. Um, that's why I can cover some of the same content that I might cover in a Pluralsight course. People will still watch the Pluralsight course because it's all polished and, and all ready and done and cleaned up. And, you know, I can teach in 20 minutes on a prepared Pluralsight course what I might spend two hours going through in a stream. And people's time is valuable and their attention span is limited. So they'd rather watch the, the quick... YouTube or uh, Pluralsight course, then watch the really long YouTube stream. Tips on how to avoid API endpoints becoming too cruddy. Maybe if I use clickbait titles like "coded with 
cat and this happened. You won't believe what happened during this stream. Yeah. The Twitch, Twitch streams are nice because of the interactivity, right? If you're going to watch a Twitch stream and expect it to just be like a conference presentation, then uh, you're going to be disappointed. But, you know, the fact that you can have a conversation with me, even if it's only in text, you can ask questions exactly as early as um, makes it much different. And I could be putting a lot more bells and whistles on the stream in terms of, like, you know, little icons running around on the bottom and explosions happening every time somebody joins the stream. And um, I've done some of that, but I'm just not into that as much. It's it's not my thing I like to spend my time on. Um, if I had somebody that would do that for me, yeah, that would be cool, but I don't know that really adds a lot to the content. Um, Jess Perrick, I'll get back to your question in a second. Um, in your example, it doesn't make sense, I can say... If your example doesn't, oh, I see, I see what you're saying. If the examples I'm showing don't make sense, you can always ask, right? Exactly. We tried to make a bot in C sharp, and this happened. And what happened? The clickbait. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that's your clickbait title. Good. Surly Dev, if your example doesn't make, yeah, you said that. Okay. Well, that is true. YouTube mostly shows older content with lots of views, which is annoying. That's true. Yeah, their algorithm focuses on popularity and things that have more views. The older something is, obviously, the more long, the more it's been around and getting views. So. It may show you more content. Um, like when you asked about strategy, I was able to show it to you real quick. Exactly. Um, all right, so back to Jesperic. Um, tips to avoid API endpoints becoming cruddy. Expose rich domain behavior without being able to use verbs like because it's rest. There is a YouTube video that I watched uh, that kind of helped me a lot with um, how I think about HTTP. And it relates to your question, Jesperic, because the thing about CRUD in REST is that you aren't necessarily treating the HTTP layer the way you should be. Uh, and let me think if I can find this. HTTP services messages, maybe? I don't remember. Um, I don't remember the, the, the freaking video uh, name. So I like, know it was definitely on YouTube, so we could just go to YouTube. And then it was, you know, HTTP with, no, it's, so HTTP REST services messages. Um, but there's just way too much, right? The odds of me finding the right video that I found, it was by a particular person who's fairly respected, but I don't know him that well. I don't know his name off the top of my head right now. Um, so yeah, the odds of me finding this right now on the stream are about nil. But I'll sum it up for you. The point is to think about your uh, HTTP layer, your APIs, as if they were a pre-computer offices, uh, pre-computer office. So I suggest looking in my history. That's not a bad idea, although it was probably a, a year ago or more. So I probably have a lot of crap in my history before I'll find that. Uh, hey, Jeff Widmer's there. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Okay, so let's say it's 1950, there's an office, and, and you've got a RESTful service that you want to uh, do something, right? So not just CRUD, right, but you want to actually be able to manage making some behavior changes. Um, so let's, let's say we're in here again, because I've got it open, and we've got this pizza baking service, and I want to expose a pizza baking service um, through a REST endpoint so that people can make orders and, and I'll bake pizzas for them, right? Well, what would I put as an endpoint in front of this thing? Um, probably a post to create a new something. Well, am I gonna create a new pizza? Is that gonna be my endpoint? So I'm gonna have, you know, some action result uh, web API method and it's gonna take in a pizza um, and they're gonna give me whatever it is they think they want on their pizza and then I'm gonna pass that into this baking service somehow with a method I don't have yet um, to do that? No, I'm probably not going to do that, right? That, that would be a very cruddy way to do it, um, but it wouldn't work with with this service because this service doesn't even have a way for me to send it in the pizza at the moment. Um, but I would like the result of this, right? Uh, when I call, where's my test? When I call the result of this and I get back this pizza, Right? I want that to be the thing I return from my HTTP service. Um, last time, Matt, first time you're hearing about Pluralsight. Where have you been, man? Is this an education streaming service? Yes. It's a, It's probably the, the most well-known uh, software developer IT um, 
online streaming service. It's a couple hundred bucks a year for a subscription, and it has like several thousand courses. Like probably five or ten thousand courses at this point. It's pretty huge. Um, mostly caters to enterprises at this point, right? They have personal plans, but I'd say like 80 or 90 percent of their sales is companies buying plans for all their teams. Okay, so back to the example of how would we do a REST endpoint in front of some service like this, so it's not just CRUD. Um, let's pretend I've got a controller here. This is not an ASP.NET Core thing, right? So it's a public class, you know, pizza controller. This is fake, All right? And in here, it's going to have some endpoint public, you know, I'm going to give you a comment here to say what this is. So comment, this is an HTTP post, uh, and it returns an I action result. I don't want to have to pull in those namespaces though, so we're just going to make it void. Um, prepare pizza, and it has to pass in something. We'll figure out what that is in a minute. Uh, and we come in here. Okay, so the, uh, the 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 sort of rest the sort of crud way to do it would be I'd have a public class pizza DTO, and it would have whatever things I needed, and then this would take in a pizza DTO pizza. And then in here, this would be like, you know, save the pizza to the database, return, um, okay, pizza, right? Something like that. Um, so this would be sort of the, the crud way to build this thing. The thing, coming back to that, that metaphor, that um, analogy to like the 1950s office, is when, when you would go to that office to get something to get something done maybe you're having them file your taxes or you're needing to register something you know, register your business with the, the 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 office the better business bureau or whatever you don't come in there with the thing right you come in there and they give you a piece of paper and they, they say fill this form out right and you fill out this form for your request and then you slide it under the window to the to the teller and they take your form and they go put it on somebody's desk in an inbox and then that triggers some activity happening, right? But that exchange of you fill out this piece of paper and then they go take that request and do something with it is HTTP. That's what REST is, right? REST is all about messages. So I don't have a pizza DTO. I have a pizza request uh, or whatever you want to call it, right? It's still a DTO, but it's a pizza request DTO. And so this pizza request just has the information that I want on it, right? Like maybe this has, you know, public string size. And that's not gonna work. Get set, right? And it has public string um, toppings, get set. And then it has public string address to deliver to, get set, right? So that's my pizza request. I don't pass in the pizza, I pass in the request, and it has the information needed for the controller or, or the backend service to deal with that request. And so instead of just saving the thing you pass me to the database, now I process your request. Now, all I might do in that case, if I'm literally encapsulating what this old 1950s office does, which has somebody's inbox that they put this thing on, uh, is we just say NQ uh, pizza request, right? And this would be pizza request, right? So I just throw this on a queue somewhere, and then I'm done, right? I just return back, instead of returning OK with the pizza, I just return OK, you know, success. I got your request. That's all I'm telling you. The pizza's not done yet, right? I, I'm just saying I got your request, right? When, you, when I hang up the phone after I call the delivery to, to order the pizza, or nowadays I do it online, it, it doesn't return me back the pizza, right? It, it returns me back a receipt that says thanks for your order, and then maybe it's got a cool graphic, I can see where the, the steps of the process of the pizza is happening. Um, so so that's that's the the difference, the biggest difference is think about the, the wire format that you're using for your APIs it has to be messages, has to be requests and responses. It's not the things, right? It's not the database entity. It's not the database table or row. It's just a request to make a change. It's a request to kick off a process. It's a response with a status update about the process, right? It's it's meta. It's it's a step removed from the things themselves. 
Um, Alright, let me catch up on chat here. Um, yeah, so they do special offers. There's actually a special offer right now for Pluralsight. Um, I think I mentioned it in my last newsletter. But yeah, there's a 33% offer right now going on for Pluralsight. I should probably tweet that. Let me uh, see if I can find that real quick. Hmm. Pluralsight, yeah. 33% off. Here's a link. Okay, copy that link. Um, here's a link. If you go there, that should theoretically have a 33% off thing. Um, when does that get through? It was starting on May 4th. I don't remember when it ends. Oh, it ends on May 14th. So, good through May 14th. And sure, let's cheat that. Tweet that also. Um, plural site courses, no, subscriptions. 33% off with this special link through May 14th. Please share. Boom. Tweet was sent. View. All right. There. There. Back to the chat. Boom. There. There. Any of you that are on Twitter, if you feel like sharing that, that would be awesome. All right. Um. Cook Racing UK. Ah, oh, the form is a DTO. Yes, you've got it. Uh, exactly. That's the message that we're passing back. Um, can't find 7.4 of PHP to download. I am not going to help you with PHP because I don't know PHP at all. Sorry. Uh, Simon Jeering, if you get uh, an MO, quick OT question. If I get a moment. Okay. Is it possible to make result work with endpoints or will it only work with controller-based APIs due to the filter middleware that converts? Uh, no, it'll totally work with endpoints. Um, you're talking about my result of T type, I think. And that is here. And if you're not talking about mine, there's other similar ones out there. Um, but this looks like this and has different statuses and things for like errors and validation and invalid, not found, forbidden, etc. And then in my sample, I think I have a sample in here. Yeah, in my sample, I have a filter that converts these and says, well, if my result is not found, then I'm going to return a controller not found. Um, this does definitely work. This filter will definitely work with endpoints. Uh, and that's probably a good thing to do. So let's uh, create an issue here. No, let's, uh, let's grab another window. Um, this is a guest window. Let me just pull this window over here where I'm actually logged in and add an issue uh, update sample to show result with filter working with endpoints. That's good enough. And then I should also show integrating result in with my clean architecture template because I haven't done that yet. I don't think result's quite done yet. Um, I think I need to put the filter into a NuGet package. I think that would be helpful so that you wouldn't have to do it yourself here. Um, so I think this result action filter, right, that's why I got this to do. So this needs to move into its own NuGet package. Maybe I'll do that on stream, maybe next week or something. So I've got that as a to-do. Do I have that as an issue? Consider no, no, I don't. So new issue. Um, make a NuGet package for the result action filter. Submit. There we go. Um, okay, so form is DTO. Last amount. I'm new to the world of software development, a very small team with only other people that went into software development from other fields. Uh, well, things like this are definitely helpful. Um, Slack groups that have a lot of professional developers in them can be helpful. It's a f another free option. Following people on Twitter and just asking questions on Twitter and, and seeing what people are talking about on Twitter that are software developers that you respect or look up to or, or you know find interesting to talk to. All of those are good things. Um, you can join a group like DevBetter if you want. That's not free, um, but it's something I offer for kind of that purpose of uh, letting people have a community where folks are trying to grow and, and develop and get better in their career. 
uh, and you know get better at, at their craft. So you look at that. All the other things I mentioned are totally free. This one's not. So if if, if you don't want to spend money on it, it's fine. Um, I do these types of things for free. I do lots of presentations and newsletters and podcasts and stuff for free. So there's a ton of free resources out there for you too. So take advantage of, of those free resources. Certainly do. So they look at the form and validate the information on it and say 200 okay, and then they go put it on someone's desk. Exactly, right? Now it depends whether the thing is something they can complete immediately or not, right? Like if it's a, a get request and it's say, hey, get me this entity number one, two, three, right? Probably you don't want to just return back and say, I got your request and nothing else, right? They're probably going to want to wait until you actually can send it. Um, so in that case, your message is a request for this information, but instead of just queuing it up somewhere and coming back to it later, you're probably going to just return it. But that's not always true either, right? Because sometimes it's like, I need this report of, you know, all of our sales by region for last year. Maybe you don't feel like waiting for that report. Maybe you're going to get a push notification when the report is ready, or you're going to get an email that tells you, hey, you can download your report. So even on a get, it might just be that you queue up the request and you let them know, hey, I got your request. I'll let you know when it's ready. Um, Cook Racing UK, hey, last minute. This may be heavy going in, but don't stress. Yeah, well, I, mean, I try to answer questions as we go, so I'll keep it pretty, uh, at least for my streams, I'll try and keep it so everything's understandable, even for folks that are kind of new. Tony Davis accepted. What did you accept? I've, you know, I need threaded conversations on here, because this is really hard to see what I'm talking about with each person. Tony Davis, last thing you said was you can't anticipate their needs. Okay, so hopefully you're 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 good. All right. Last of Matt. Thanks. Found a couple of good streamers with nice chats that are always helpful. No problem. Try the sponge tactic. Absorb stuff. Wait for it to connect. That's a good good uh, tactic. Uh, Just Spark, thanks so much. That's really helpful. You're very welcome. Uh, last minute, thanks. Throw the dev. It's a good tactic. I do it with podcasts, etc. Yeah, so just absorbing stuff is great. The other thing, though, last minute, you have to write code. You have to practice. So, you know, find some way to just just play with the code somewhere. I recommend putting it up on GitHub um, because then it's a record there that you can always go back to and see. You might implement something sometime and really learn how you did it, and then three weeks later you've totally forgotten it, uh, but you know that you did it. And so you can go into your GitHub and you can be like, okay, here's where I did that, um, and, and apply that to some problem you're in the middle of at work or whatever. Um, I like to put stuff that I've learned into my own con content, my own repository, my own blog, uh, so that it's there for me later when I want to search for it. And I can't tell you how often I search for things on Google and it comes back to my stuff. Sometimes it's totally by accident, like I totally forgot that I'd already solved that problem, and poof, there I am at my own blog post. Um, a lot of the times I know I already solved it and I'm just trying to find my own content, so I just Google and I just put Ardalis into the search terms, because that's my blog name, and it will find my blog post for me very quickly. Right? So I don't even have to remember URLs for my own blog posts, I just Google for them. Um, all right, so what was the PHP question? No, talking about your other one. That's more my bag. I was looking to use it as a result. That's exactly what I was about to write. Then I came across endpoints. Wanted to ask if it's okay to use both. Yes, you can. Um, Catalyst, non, Catalystics Ninite. That's probably not how you say that. Um, thanks for the follow. Simon Jiren, does the endpoint also exclusively rely on attribute-based swagger to work, or will it pick up XML comments still? The uh, the end the endpoint stuff is literally just uh, controllers, right? If you look at this code, base endpoint, base endpoint is controller base. So anything that works with an MVC controller or works with an API controller will work with an endpoint. I did that on purpose because I didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel. And all this other tooling and stuff like Swagger and other things already work with controllers. So there was no reason to build a whole separate thing that then all this other stuff doesn't work with because it's brand new and it's not like Microsoft built it or anything, so nobody's building stuff for it. Um, and then have to reinvent the wheel to get all that stuff to work. So so that's why this is just using controllers. Uh, so any, any question you have about, hey, does this other stuff that works with controllers still work with endpoints? The answer should be yes, because they are controllers. I got the feeling you're using the attribute approach to enable endpoint grouping in the Swagger JSON, but I already have a bunch of XML comments that would have to be converted to the attribute approach. Um, yeah, by default, Swagger uses, um, I think it's route-based. It uses, it tags them based on their route, and the route is based on the controller. Uh, and so what you end up seeing is groupings 
I can actually show you. Clean, no, that's not the right one. Let me pull up my clean architecture sample. I've got it right here. I think I know what you're asking about, Simon Jerk. The real reason I'm using COVID quarantine time to build a portfolio app so I have a real world reference to learn on something sizable. That's excellent. It's a good, good option. Uh, Tony Davis. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. No, when you said accepted the first time, I, I knew what you meant. And then when I went back to it, I totally forgot the context. But yeah, a 202 accepted would be perfect for the... I got your message and I'm, I'm going to do something with it. But I, I'm not ready to give you a real answer yet. Uh, kind of thing. Alright, so this is my clean architecture sample. It's currently broken. Why is it broken? Uh, I was doing some work on it. Let's go changes. Changes. I got a lot of crap in here. Do I need any of this? Yeah, I don't want to throw all that away. Uh, Alright, let's just fix it. I just want to show you the swagger endpoint. So, in the database populator, in the to-do item, ah, uh, that's what I did. Um, I was showing a bad example, something you can't do. Alright, that needs to go away. Um, where is to-do item? Hmm. These are things you can't do. There. And that should be there. Alright, uh, when we run this, we go to Swagger, you can see this, so a, a controller, the To-Do Items API controller, um, by default groups things based on that controller's name, which is also its route, uh, and shows you all of its endpoints. Alright, so that To-Do Items there corresponds to this To-Do Items controller here, and you can see it's just using the verbs, and I don't have anything special to get Swagger to do the right thing. Um, so get, get, post, patch corresponds to get, get, post, patch. Not necessarily in the same order. Now the endpoints version is here, and I have create, delete, get, list, update um, for those. And if we look at these, I did add this attribute with the Swagger information. Um, and I added this tag so that it would group them appropriately. I don't have a better way to do this currently. Uh, I'm still playing with it. This is just my latest iteration. So if you don't do this at all, what you end up with in Swagger is a separate uh, top-level heading like this for each endpoint, which isn't awful. But if you want to group them together, which you probably do, and this, this should probably say to do item endpoints, plural, because these are each an endpoint, um, then you just add that tag. Right? And you don't have to add all that extra junk that I put in there. You could just put in the tags thing and be done with it. Um, I was just playing around to see what else I could add in here with these. So probably this ought to be in points plural. If I change just that one, what's going to happen is uh, it's going to create its own group, theoretically. So let's see if that does. I killed my, yeah, I killed my server. All right, so now there's endpoints plural and endpoint singular. Um, so let me just finish making that change to the rest of them. Now they're all under endpoints, plural, which I like better. And theoretically, these these things right here, these descriptions, are coming from those those attributes also. Um, let's see, where's so that summary? I'm not sure whether it's the summary or the description. I wasn't sure which one of those, which one's the short one, uh, which one's the long one. I could add, you know. Updates a to-do item with a longer description. Right, so that's on update. Updates, so that's the short one. And then there's the longer description right there. Okay. Um, and then the operation ID, that just needs to be a unique ID. And then this is the tag that is used to group them. 
Uh, thanks for taking the time to explain this for making both those labs and guard they have will save me much time if my app is following the clean architecture design so your packages fit nicely with my design. Awesome. It's great, I can just add the groups then and so adoption work will be minimal. Good. It's summary in XML doc comments. Right, so you would just take these, maybe copy paste them or do some regex to, to convert them from your doc comments into this. Uh, or maybe there's some way if that Swagger already reads from those doc comments. If there is, then maybe you can just add the tag somehow into the doc comments for it. Um, I don't remember if I've used the Swagger XML Are you saying that this already supports doing this? Let's check uh, Matthew Jones's blog here. Configure Swagger, tell it to include XML comments. But that's just going to use them for documentation purposes. That's not going to group them and stuff, is it? There's that, and then Swagger is going to pull that out. Okay, so that's cool. Um, this is, I like this uh, layout that he's got here. That's a good call out. Okay, but I don't see any way to group them in here. So when he did that configuration, where's this, where's this call? Here. Um, title, version, path. Yeah, there's nothing in here about tags. And I know tags is how it does the grouping. Um, but yeah, so it does the rest of it. Okay, the grouping was the thing I had the, the hardest trouble with. Like, really, the grouping was the only thing I cared about when I was playing with it, because without the tags, these were each their own separate thing, which I didn't like. So. So I only need to add the group attribute, and the rest will work as it does now. Yes, should. Exactly. Let me know if it doesn't. Uh, thanks for the follow on RVTN. I appreciate it. We got a decent number of people in here today. What's our uh, total count up to, I wonder? There's some way for me to see that. Um, 47 viewers? That's not bad. Uh, let's see if I can finish committing whatever the heck it is I was working here on so I don't leave it in a bad state. So, those of you that haven't seen this clean architecture um, thing before. Let me let me show you the GitHub URL for it. So github.com or Dallas Clean Architecture is a solution template that you can use that I maintain, um, and it's meant to be like where you start. So you say file new uh, project um, with this solution. And I'm just looking at my stream in the other window, and it's like really delayed. So. Hopefully that's not a problem. I guess nobody's been complaining about it. But if there's a big delay on when I see your chat, that's why. Because you're not responding to things until well after I've already moved on. Anyway. Um, thanks for the follow, Dan602. So early Dave's got to take dinner to his mom. He's been listening on audio only. So if you're going to go on by the time I get back, have a nice weekend. You too. Neoashi, welcome back. Hello. Um... I am just wrapping up here. We talked about uh, design patterns earlier in the stream and, and set up a, an example of the template method pattern, which is out in this branch, um, which I think is all up to date. Let's verify that's all good to go. Yep. So let's finish cleaning that one up while I'm here. Uh, go to, we'll do a pull request on that real quick. Design patterns in C sharp. There's my thing. I'm going to pull request it. This is template method demos. And do that. And merge it. Alright, so now master should be up to date. I'm going to keep my branch because I'm going to want to look at that branch when I'm doing the course. Simon Jaring, to start up here, does Swagger XML comments? Uh, let's check that out. Ah, I see what you're saying. When you said startup, I was thinking like a, like a internet startup, you know, like a company. Um, quick, uh, da, 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 all right. There's your include XML comments there. But fluent validation rules, Swagger doc. 
Okay, still nothing in any of these about tags or grouping. So, but but yeah, you can get the comments to be in there, which is nice. Neo Ashi, quick question: How do we get Swagger to support OpenID Connect and get the token and access token after authentication and call the endpoints in Swagger? There's an option for it in the Fluent API config. Can't recall if it needs an additional NeGet package or not. Is the correct answer? Yeah. Um, so yes, you can. Actually, here's Open API. No, that's that's not it. Um, Open ID Connect. There's an option for it. Configure Swagger Gen. Uh, you can use something like this, like with Identity Server, to get your uh, Open ID configuration. Um, This says it's not yet supported, but that's from 2017. People are still waiting in April for this fix, so that's not ideal. Yeah, I know there's ways to, to hack around it. I'm not sure if this is the only way. Uh, of course, where are you at, auth? Scott Brady. So add identity server auth and specify all your identity server stuff. Tell it you use auth. Uh, and then add OAuth support here. So this is options. Add your security definition. This looks promising. I'll paste in this URL. I think this might be close to what you want. This looks pretty comprehensive, so yeah, check that out. I remember we had to go to Postman or Browser, generate the access token, and then come back to Swagger. Yeah, I've done that a million times too, Niyoashi. Um, admin assistant uh, Blazer, huh? Yeah, I didn't see what this uh, thing actually did. So you've got a Blazor app here for your admin assistant thing, Simon Jeering. I'll have to check this out more. Cool. All right, um, I'm done with the design pattern stuff. We merged that in to master. Of course, I uh, have a file that's not saved. Um, why? What did I do? Oh, I was talking about queuing things up. Alright, I don't care about that. That pizza controller junk could all go. Um, so yeah, don't save that. Alright, close this. And then I just wanted to clean up clean architecture um, before I commit it. Make sure there's nothing in here that I don't want to commit. So let's make sure all our tests pass. That's the portfolio app you mentioned. Okay. Alright, so that's that. Where's my test window? It's all good. Let's see what we have in the way of changes. Um, we added a two string. We added email sending. We changed this thing. We added that interface. We wired those things up there. Okay. This all looks good. What did I do with these? Oh, I changed them all to S, right. And I don't know why this library got updated, but that's fine. We fix this, and we fix this. This all looks good. Alright, so updated to actually send emails when a to-do item is completed using a local host email service. That's good. Commit and sync and push this out. Alright, uh, since we've got y'all here, let me show you one last quick demo of what this thing does. If you haven't seen it before, I would love for more people to check it out. Tell me uh, 
if you have anything you want it to do that it doesn't already do. Um, but this clean architecture solution template has a bunch of stuff in it, but it's not designed to be a sample app so much as a starting point for you. Um, and so it supports if you want to build something with an API or something with MVC controllers or even something with endpoints um, or razor pages, all those things are supported in here and you just keep the one you like and get rid of the ones you don't like. Um, you know, if you're not using all four of those, which you're probably not. Uh, it has a little database it creates just for demo purposes and when you run it, it'll recreate it. Uh, and so here's what it looks like. <clears throat> it has a uh, to-do item like uh, I was showing and you can list what the to-do items are, which are get the sample working, which it is, review it, which we're doing now, and then run it and review the tests, which we're kind of doing. Um, you can do that with MVC, you can do that with Razor Pages, you can look at the Swagger docs, here's what it looks like, we already saw this. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can mark an item as complete. Let me see if I've got my email server still running. So I've got Paper Cut running, um, we'll delete that. And so here's Paper Cut, which is a local test email server. Um, we'll put these things side by side, and we'll go hit this, uh, let's do the get. Let's list all the items execute and you'll see <clears throat> here's one two three items and is done is false for each one All right now we're gonna go and hit this complete endpoint and the complete endpoint lets me specify the ID so we completed item one execute and it's gonna use domain events to trigger firing off this email from code that was run in the entity uh, and the domain events pattern works really well for this type of thing and so you see I've got my email right here. It was to test.com, from test.com, at 2.05 p.m. right now. Get the sample working. Um, that's all good. We can do two, execute that. And we get the same thing. Now number two is done. Um, and, and et cetera, right? So it works. A uh, couple things it doesn't currently have that it would have if it were real and that I cover in like some of the labs I do for training classes is you know, mark complete can be called as many times as you want right now, and it'll always send an email. What if it was already complete, right? It probably should only do this work if the thing wasn't already done, right? So that's like a, an exercise for the user that you can add something there to have some if logic. Uh, Boker 2 man, good seeing you again. See you next Friday. Um, but that's, that's pretty much what this uh, clean architecture thing does. Um, we just push the latest, so here's the URL again to go get it. Let's go here. Clean architecture there. GitHub.com. Um, last updated three minutes ago. So go go check that out. Give it a star. Uh, download it. Um, I should probably add some topics to this, shouldn't I? Like clean architecture. Architecture. That's good enough for now. Done. Um, cool. All right. Let's uh, let's wrap this up for today. Let's find who we can go and attack with a raid. So if we got to twitch.tv slash live coders here. These are all live coders, people that do this type of thing. Um, usually I end up sending people over to like Clarkio. He's always got lots of people. Um, but uh, let's, go, let's go hit up Mark Miller. He's always entertaining. So I'm going to jump into my uh, stream manager here and pull this over here and we'll say raid a channel for code rushed start raid he's only got like seven people watching so he's gonna be totally surprised when 40 or so of you all show up in there um, looks like we have 41 people so I'm gonna pop over into Mark's twitch and I'll see you there I'll hang out for a few minutes and then uh, I'll catch up with you next week. Have a nice weekend.